Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you could join me for this JUMP Academic Series webinar on data summary and analysis. During this hour, I'll cover some standard and a few more advanced methods of data summary and analysis in JUMP. You're probably going to get the most out of this webinar if you've already seen JUMP before, but if you haven't, don't worry. You should still be able to follow along, and I'll try to point out some keys to using JUMP as we go along. So first, I'll quickly point out some great places to go to find resources for learning, for teaching, for using JUMP, including other live and recorded webinars like this one. Then we'll talk about summarizing and graphing data in JUMP, and we're going to spend a bit of time here before we move on to basic analyses, including univariate and bivariate analyses, and then how to extend these to multivariable analyses. Then we'll talk briefly about classification and regression trees, about modern variable selection methods using generalized regression. I'll talk about using mixed models, which can include random effects and repeated measures. And then we'll talk about multivariate analyses, like looking at correlations, clustering variables, finding principal components, factor analysis. Also new in JUMP 13 is the ability to do text exploration, so I'll show you how to generate word clouds, and I'll give you a quick tour around this new platform. And at the end, we'll recap the highlights, and I'll take any questions. Okay, so let's get started looking at some resources for learning JUMP. I definitely want you to go to the JUMP academic community. The website is jump.com slash JAC, and this is a great place. A lot of our uh, uh, the, the resources that are available on our main webpage are also available on the academic community, plus there's just a great place for you to engage with other academics who are using JUMP. The JUMP Learning Library is another thing I certainly want you to go to. So I'm hopping over to the academic webpage. So jump.com slash teach will take you to our academic webpage and pop you right down here to resources for learning and using JUMP. And I specifically today want to draw your attention to this first column about learning JUMP. These getting started videos are 20 to 25 minute videos. So if you are a new user, this is a nice place to go back to get some more um, just basic information about navigating and using JUMP. And then the learning library is another excellent resource. If you just want to know how to do a specific topic, like how do I get a correlation? Hop over to our learning library and you'll find a one page guide on how to find a correlation. And then a short two to three minute video that explains the, the same thing that's covered in the one page guide. So if you want very quickly to learn a few specific topics, the learning library is an amazing resource. And then the academic webcast is another place I want to direct your attention today. This is where you can find recordings of other webcasts and sign up for future webcasts. So let me take you over to that page very quickly. So right now we're on this data summary and analysis webcast. If you want to sign up for future webcasts, this is where you can click on these and get uh, signed up. You can also hop over to the Jump, Jump Academic community from here to find the recordings of these webcasts. And then another resource that I think is very underused and shouldn't be, I, I really want you to go here as well, is the help menu in Jump. Right in Jump, the help uh, you can search for topics, you can search for terms. The books is where you can find the documentation for JUMP. I'm a documentation user myself, and so if I want to know how to, for example, make a custom map, I would go to Essential Graphing and then look for Custom Map if I want to learn how to build my own maps in, in JUMP. Um, also in the books, the scripting guide, if you want to learn to use the JUMP scripting language called JSL, the scripting guide is a great place to get little snippets of code so that you can duplicate things and figure out kind of quickly how to use the scripting language. And the documentation library as well um, has a, another searchable place to find a lot of um, things you might be looking for. The statistics index is a great place. Again, if you're looking for one specific topic, like how to find a correlation, how to find a Mahalanobis distance, you can go to the statistics index and search for that specific term. And so, for example, if I want to know how to make a 3D scatter plot, I can look for 3D scatter plot, and then I can click on topic help if I want more information about it. I can click run example if I want to see that script run. So here I see a 3D scatter plot on this data set. It pulled open a data set for me to show this example. Or I can click on launch if I want to see where to go. Maybe I should keep that data set open. So I'll run example again. So now I have the solubility data set open. And I can click on launch if I want to see where to go to actually build that 3D scatter plot. And that would have been from the graph menu and from scatter plot 3D. So using this help menu in jump and the statistics index is a great place to find specific topics. Sample data is another amazing resource. 
the sample data uh, shows the sample data directory, which jump ships with over 500 sample data sets, so you can find a lot of data sets to, to explore or play around with. But if you specifically want to learn about or teach about a certain topic, like you want to teach ANOVA, if you want to look at a two-way ANOVA example, this data set is specifically a great example for showing a two-way ANOVA. So when, whether you're teaching or learning a topic, this sample data index is a great place to go to find what sort of data sets can, can be examples of what you want to learn. And then if you want to look for data sets according to a, a type of data, like medical studies, you can use the categorized by type of data. And then the teaching resources includes a lot of other resources as well for teaching, so a lot of great examples for teaching. Teaching scripts, which include distribution generators, sampling distribution of sample means, interactive things that you can demonstrate, teaching demos on Bayes rule, collinearity. There are a number of things. The calculators, if you want to show how to conduct a hypothesis test for one mean, et cetera. Simulations, if you want to show a simulation of the central limit theorem. So there's a number of really excellent teaching tools here as well. So please go to our Jump Academic community. Go to our jump.com slash teach to find those resources and go to the Jump Help. These are three really, really valuable resources for learning um, and using Jump. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, some things in Jump. I'm going to open this U.S. demographics data set. And this data set has 50 rows in it, uh, one row for each of the states, and then there's a number of variables that, that we have information on the averages for the state, so the average household income for the state, the average IQ, what region of the U.S. that state is in, the population. And if you are a new user in JUMP, a couple things I want to point out. There's a, an icon, a modeling icon, next to each of the names of the columns. This is indicating the type of variable, the modeling type, the JUMP is considering this variable. So state is nominal because it's categories and they're in name only. Region is also nominal. And then the blue triangles are indicating the JUMP is going to treat these as continuous variables. If you want to treat variables in a different way, then you can use the, the sidebar to change the modeling type. You can also double click on a, a column name and find, here's the data type, this was entered as numeric data, and then the modeling type here is continuous. And I can also find other information about this column. So the column properties allows me to add things like notes. So here I can see for the household income, I've added a note that says this is the mean household income in dollars. If I were creating a new column, I could use a formula here. I could use value labels and value ordering. I use the value labels and value ordering very often. That's going to determine what order values show up when I'm doing something with categories, for example. And here you can also see the format for data. I can change it from uh, currency right now. I have currency in, in U.S. dollars. So when these values show up, they show up with a dollar sign. So there's a lot you can get to just from the data set itself. So I was double clicking on these to get this information. Eighth grade math is an interesting one for me to look at because I don't actually understand what this score is. These are eighth grade math scores, averages for states. But this one, unfortunately, doesn't have a note, so it doesn't tell me anything extra about this particular variable. So something I might do if I wanted to explore this variable more, I could go to Analyze and to Distribution. So this is one place I often go when I'm opening a new data table to explore some information. And I, I care right now about learning about what sort of scores are in this eighth grade math column. So I'll put that into Columns and say OK. And I can see that the maximum score for eighth grade math was 291. 0.51. The minimum was 262.21. I see a histogram of this information. I can use this little hand to drag this if I want to rescale things. I can see summary statistics, the mean, standard deviation. So I'm guessing, based on the average being 291, that this uh, score might have been out of 300 or 400. Keeping in mind this was an average for the whole state. And I can use these red triangles to look for lots of other options. So for eighth grade math here, I can look for things like uh, adding the counts onto the histogram. I can add a normal quantile plot for this. I can test the mean for this distribution. So if I wanted to test, is, is the true mean of that uh, eighth grade math score is maybe 285? And I don't know the standard deviation. I want to get a Wilcoxon find rank test, so I can say OK. And so that gives me this output, including a picture of what the p-value means. So I get the p-value here for the test statistic for this test. And here's the signed rank statistic. So there's a lot I can get from distribution for exploring data. And I can also get a lot from the graph builder and, and the graph 
uh, menu bar. So I spend a lot of time here in analyzing graph as I'm exploring data, and then I hop back over here to tables, to rows and columns to manipulate my data set. I'm not going to spend as much time here today, but that's actually a large portion of what I'm doing when I'm doing an analysis is I'm cleaning data. And so I often need to do things like subset data to just look at certain values in a separate table, or I might mark certain rows. I might look at, at column properties. I might recode something. So there's a lot of functionality here in tables, rows, and columns for data cleaning and data manipulation. But I'll spend a lot of time today in analyzing graph to explore the data and then to do some analysis. So if I go to graph builder to explore some of these variables, I might look at, for example, let's look at eighth grade math as a predictor variable. So I can see I have these drop zones that show up in graph builder. So I'm just dragging this variable around and sticking it in different places. And as I hover it in different places, jump shows me a preview of what it's gonna look like if I drop it into that zone. So I'm gonna use eighth grade math as the predictor variable. And I'm gonna predict maybe household income for the state based on eighth grade math. So I get a scatter plot of the points. And then I get this smoothed fitted line. I don't really like this fitted line that much, so maybe I'm gonna click off of it, or I could click it back on. If I want multiple elements, I can drag them and drop them on. So I'm gonna again click the smoother off. Right now I've put on a best fit line with a confidence interval band. And so if I go over here to the side, I can choose more options related to the points from the scatter plot, or more options related to that line of fit I just added. So for example, I can put the equation right into this plot. I can put the R squared in. I could put a prediction interval as well. So here's the confidence interval is this darkest one in the middle, and then a prediction interval is the, the lighter shading. And then I could try throwing on another variable. If I wanted to split this relationship up for region of the United States, Again, I can hover and see lots of different drop zones, and again, I see options as I'm hovering over those spots. I could group by region. I could group on the y-axis instead by region. I could wrap by region, overlay all of the regions on top of each other, or maybe I've decided I don't want to split it out by region. So I'm going to click Done right now. This is the, the plot that I'm interested in right now. And if I want to export this, if I want to use this in a publication or in a report, I can use this fat plus sign and click on it and control C, control V, or copy paste this into another document. That's one way to export. Another way to export is to go to file and to export. And I can take this out as an image file, a variety of different image file types. I can take this out as HTML or interactive HTML with data. I can take this out directly into PowerPoint. So there's a number of ways to export this. But what I really want to show you right now is a, a few tips. So again, assuming you've used Jump before, you might be at the stage now that you want to use Jump a little more efficiently. So if, if you're a new user, red triangles are really important in Jump. And right-clicking, right-clicking or control-clicking on a Mac, these are ways to find extra things to do in Jump. But the red triangles is the most important. So there's always lots of options of things that you can do. Drill down options when you're doing an analysis or just further ways to edit output. And in this case, if you're a, a jump user already, I really want to draw your attention to being more efficient by using these tools that are right below this little gray line. The local data filter, and also some of these tools that are in Redo and Save Script. We're going to talk about all of these a little bit today. So the local data filter is a way for me to filter by certain rows in the data set. So if I click on the local data filter, I can look at this plot unique to just certain groupings of parts of the rows. So if I click on region, for example, and add this as a data filter, I, right now I have this equation and R squared and, and this plot for all of the states together. But if I click on just the Midwest, now I have a, a subset of the data. Only the Midwest is forming this line, this confidence interval, this prediction interval, the R squared and the equation. So if you watch the R squareds, for example, you can see just the Midwest has about a 22% and just the Northeast has 3%. The South has 44%, so it looks like the South fits a line the best. The West is just 3%. And if I clear this and go back to the original, I can see the R squared for the whole data set is 14%. So you can see that I'm filtering out the analysis just by region as I use this local data filter. And if I start over 
and use a different variable type instead of categorical if I look at, for example, population and filter by population size. I now get this sliding scale. And so if I slide it way down, it looks like a lot of the data are on the low end. So if I slide it up, yeah, I only have one point at these high populations. So it looks like I can tell already from this slider that this is a, a skewed distribution. I could go back to distribution to confirm that. And so I can use the slider to choose what data points show up in this plot. I can also click on these little boxes and I can type in values right here. So the local data filter is a way to filter by rows. Another great thing to use, still down in this below the little gray line, so the local data filter is filtering by rows. I also want to show you the column switcher, which switches out which variables I'm looking at. I'm going to do this by first creating a map. So let's go back to graph and graph builder and start over. You can see this little map shape box as one of the drop zones. Jump ships with several map shape files, including if you have a column of data that just has state names in it, or a column of data that has country names in it, Jump is going to recognize that as a, a map shape that it, it knows about. So if I just drag state names into this map shape, Jump is going to create a map of the US for me. And now if I drag, for example, household income on top of this or into the color box, I'm now going to see this color gradient scaled for household income. So the gray is the average across the state averages. And the red is states that have higher than average household income. And the blue is states that have lower than average household income. So if I click Done, here again, I'll just quickly show you what the local data filter would do for this. I could use region again. And if I click on the Midwest, I'm just going to see this rescaled. So the scale is now relative just to the Midwest. So I'll see just the Midwest. I'll see just the Northeast, just the South. Notice in the South right now, Virginia is very red because Virginia is much higher than the rest of the South in, in comparison to the rest of the South. But if I clear this, Virginia is just sort of typical. It's in the gray compared to the entire United States. So you can see that we're rescaling based on which filter we're in, which area we're in. So let me clear this. And so that was the filtering by rows. If I go to redo, and use the column switcher, this is going to let me swap in and out different columns into this analysis. So what I want to do here is leave the states on the map. I want to keep the map there, and I want to swap out household income with other variables. So I'll say OK, and maybe I want to look at IQ and population and all these other variables that are uh, similar, and I could do in a, a color gradient like I did on this map. So now I can quickly flip between different variables on this map. So here I'm looking at IQ across the nation. Here I'm looking at population. California is much larger than other states. Texas is the next in population. Here's eighth grade math scores, high school graduates, gross state product, vegetable consumption, proportion of smokers, physical activity, obesity, percentage of college degrees, and alcohol consumption. So I can quickly explore data by using these tools that are in the red triangle. I'll, I'll remove these again. So the red triangle below this little gray line, the local data filter lets me explore by filtering out rows. And under redo, the column switcher lets me explore by swapping out different columns. I also want you to notice this redo analysis and relaunch analysis. Relaunch analysis is a great tool if you want to remember what steps you went through to get to this plot, so clicking relaunch analysis shows you what you put into the Y, what you put into the X, all the options that you chose. So relaunch analysis can be really helpful. And save script, if you save script to data table, it gives you a, an option to select a name, so I'll call this state colored by population. And if I go back to the data table, I now have state colored by population with this little green play button. This allows me to just instantly click on it to repeat what I did before. So this can be a great way to save yourself time in the future if you're exploring data and you just want to save what you've done and then be able to get back to it quickly. It can also help you then if you use that in tandem with redo and relaunch analysis. This reminds you of what steps you went through in order to get to this plot. So I would highly recommend using, if, if you're trying to become more efficient using Jump, start looking at this local data filter, look at this redo column switcher, 
and relaunch analysis. These are really, and, and saving script to the data table. These are, are great features that help you get a little bit faster in what you're doing and, and switch between options more quickly. Okay, but we also might want to look at um, what we can find from the distribution platform. So if I click on Analyze and Distribution, this is univariate statistics, but it also lets me explore a lot, um, even in bivariate relationships. It's a univariate platform, but I can click around and see sort of how variables are interacting with each other from this platform. So if I choose a few variables and put them into the Y column and say OK, I now get univariate one at a time analyses of each of these variables. And you can see that for region, which is a categorical variable, I get a slightly different output than I do for the other variables that were continuous. So this is because jump is context dependent. And so what modeling type, that little icon next to the variable, the blue triangle for continuous versus the little red steps uh, or green steps for, for categorical types of variables, you'll get different options within the same platform depending on that modeling type. So for region, I get some options like I can ask for um, counts or probabilities to be added. So I could add counts into this. I can test probabilities. I can get a confidence interval. So there are a number of things I can do here for a categorical variable, and I get different options, uh, a few things that, that are, will pertain to both platforms, but a lot of different options because of, this is a continuous variable instead of categorical. So here I get test mean instead of test probability. I could ask for a normal quantile plot here. I could test this population distribution against a number of theoretical distribution, so I could see is it conceivable that it comes from a normal distribution, log normal distribution, all of these distributions. I could ask for a test against all of these at the same time. And so Jump is going to use the corrected AIC fit statistic and say the smallest one is the best fit, and so the log normal fits this data the best. Here's the scale and shape parameters and their estimates for the fitted log normal, log normal distribution, and here's the fit of the log normal distribution superimposed on my data distribution. So there are a number of things I can do right here from the Analyze platform to explore data. Another thing I can do, if, if I click on something in one of these plots, Jump is dynamically interactive. So if I click on the West region, I can see the data distribution of the West region on all of these other variables. So this is a way to use this univariate platform to explore bivariate and multivariate relationships because of this interactivity. I can also click and make myself a little box on these outliers in this population distribution, and I can see where those points show up in the other distribution. So are these points outliers only on population, or are they also outliers in IQ and in household income? So I can explore some questions like that. If I find data points that are outliers and I believe that they need to be excluded from the analysis, I can highlight them and I can control click or right click. I can color those points. I can mark those points with a marker so that every other analysis I do or plot that I create, I'll see those points with this marker or this color. I can row, hide, and exclude if I want to not include them in any future analysis. So there's a lot you can do from exploring data and from this interactivity. And the interactivity, this dynamic linkage, happens in every plot and every analysis that you have open in Jump. Okay, I want to show you quickly a few other things you can do with Graph Builder. So I'm going to use those play buttons to show you. So here's a bubble plot on Napoleon's march. So Napoleon's army is going over to Moscow, and the size of the bubble is the size of the army. So as the bubble shrinks, you'll watch the army getting smaller. As Napoleon's army is on the attack, the bubble will be in red. When they start retreating, the bubble will be in blue, and I can click this play, and we can watch Napoleon's army move across Europe. And now they turn around and start retreating. And we saw these two little groups split off, and we'll see them rejoin. And so here's a time, if you wanted to create a bubble plot like this, and you have this example, this example is in jump, if you open the Napoleon's March data set, you'll have this jump on that play button. And so if you go to the red triangle and go to redo and relaunch analysis, this will show you exactly how this bubble plot was created. 
the latitude and longitude were moved into X and Y. So this, instead of having a map shape file, is using latitude and longitude to create a map. The ID was group, the time was progress, the, it was sized by the army size, and the color was the direction, the attack or retreat. And if I say OK, you'll notice this pops up without the background map. So here's one of those times, remember, red triangles and right-clicking. So this is a time where if I right-click or control-click, I can add a background map. So here I could add, for example, the detailed Earth background map. And now I get that background map. OK, and then the, there's a, a tabulate version of Graph Builder, which is for creating ta tables. So if I go to tabulate, I can do some more data exploration using a table format. I get, again, drop zones. Like Graph Builder, it looks a little simpler, but there are some hidden drop zones again. And so if I wanted to, to look at, um, let me pull up a different data set. Let's, let's look at the US demographics instead. So analyze, tabulate. If I want to look at, for example, household income, I can drop this into columns. Right now it gave me a statistic of the sum. That may not be interesting to me. If I want to swap it out or add things, I can choose new statistics from this list. And let's say I want to look at household income uh, for the various states. I want to create a table with all the states and their household incomes. So maybe I want to put the mean on here. Now, each state only had one observation, so the, the mean is actually the one observation for that state. Maybe I want to put um, the region on here. So I can start discovering some hidden drop zones here. If I hover region right before state, you might be able to see that small blue rectangle. This is going to let me prepend region. And if I hover on the other side, I can append region to the state. So let me try appending first. So this says, the state was Alabama, the region was the south. If I do it the other direction, and I prepend, now the hierarchy here is region first, and then all the states in that region. So then when I have a, a table that I like, I can click Done. I can again use the FAT plus sign to click on this and Control-C, Control-V, or copy-paste this into something else. Or I can use the file Export in order to export this in a number of different ways. OK, and so we looked at the Napoleon's March, the bubble plot, and the line. Uh, actually, I think we didn't look at the line plot. Let's, let's quickly look at this option as well. So we looked at the bubble plot of Napoleon's March. Here's a line plot, so another option. This is sizing the width of the line by the army size, so you can watch the progression across to Moscow, and then you can watch the retreat. And here you can see this was when one group split off, and then it rejoins. Here's another group that split off, and it rejoins. So there are a lot of different types of, of graphics that you can create from Graph Builder and from the Graph platform. Here's another Graph Builder. So you can also include image files in a SAS data set. And so here, doing a Graph Builder of some SAS offices. Now SAS has offices, I think there are 400 SAS offices across the, the globe. This data set has 22 of these offices, their locations. So I can see here's the headquarters. And the image shows up in this picture here. And I can pin this if I want to. So now if I'm happy with this plot, this is the way I can export this plot, or I can move this, this guy around. So if you want to use these call-out boxes, just hover and then pin. So that's another nice visualization. And one more great visualization, just so you know some of the options that are available, are, is making a custom graph. So this is looking at the layout of an office building. And so this is a custom map that was created. If you want to know more about how to make custom maps, go to the Help menu, go to the Books, and go to Essential Graphing and look for custom maps. So in this example, this is the custom map in the background. And then we can add variables on top of that. So here's looking at the average temperature in offices. So we can see that this office is hotter than most of the other offices. This office is hotter. And we can explore reasons for this. I think in this case, these were break rooms. They either had copiers in them or refrigerators in them, something that would make them hotter. Um, so there's a lot you can do with custom maps as well. OK, so we talked about some options in Graph Builder. We talked about using distribution to explore data and that dynamic linkage. And we also talked about uh, when running an analysis, 
using this red triangle and the things below the gray bar, like the local data filter, the redo column switcher, relaunch analysis, and save script to data table. So don't forget these tools are here that can make you much more efficient in using Jump. All right, let's explore a little bit more that univariate platform and then fit Y by X, which is our bivariate platform, and then moving into fit model for more complicated things. So I'm gonna open this fitness data set. So in Analyze, distribution is univariate, fit Y by X is bivariate, and fit model is multi things that have multiple Y variables or multiple X variables. So this is where we're gonna go when we start extending models. So distribution is incredibly useful for exploring data, for looking at that dynamic linkage. Fit Y by X is really helpful, especially in intro stats classes when you're learning some of the mechanisms of regression, of a chi-squared analysis, et cetera. Uh, but once you're into more complicated models, when you have more than one X or more than one Y, then you're gonna spend a lot more time down here in fit model and possibly even in these specialized platforms. So let's go to fit Y by X now and look at this data set has uh, oxygen uptake as the response variable and we wanna predict oxygen uptake based on a number of other features about these participants. So for example, their age might be predictive or their sex might be predictive. So right now I'm putting in age and sex as X factor. But remember this platform is only bivariate. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get an age predicting oxygen uptake and another analysis for sex predicting oxygen uptake. And this little picture down here is really helpful for reminding you what types of analyses you'll get based on these modeling types. So since I have oxygen uptake, as, uh, the response is continuous. For age predicting that, so continuous predicting continuous, I'll get a bivariate regression type analysis. For sex predicting this, I'll get a one-way ANOVA type analysis because sex is categorical predicting continuous. If I had categorical predicting categorical, I'd get a chi-squared contingency type of analysis, and continuous predicting categorical, I'll get a logistic regression type analysis. So I can get any of these four types of analyses depending on the types of factors I put in for X and for Y. So here, for age predicting oxygen uptake, I get this scatter plot and this contextual menu option for me to do things like fit a line. So if I fit a line, I'm doing a linear regression. Here's the linear regression equation. Here's the R squared. Here's the overall ANOVA p-value. Here's the p-value for the intercept and the p-value for age. So I can see that age is actually not a significant predictor of oxygen uptake. I can get additional things from this red triangle, like I can get the confidence curves of the fit, the individual. I can shade these guys. I can save the predictive values or the residuals back to the data table. I can save the confidence limit formula and the individual confidence limit formula back to the data table. I can plot the residuals to do my analysis of the residuals. So there's certainly some sort of a trend happening, the residual by row plot. This is very interesting. You maybe suspect that there was some kind of trend to how the data were entered. And then from the ANOVA type output, so in this case, I, I have actually a t-test because there's only two groups. So when I go to this little red triangle, I see this means ANOVA pooled t option. This is gonna do a pooled variance t-test or an ANOVA, which would pool the variance as well if I have more than two groups. Or if I want a t-test for the two groups but with different variances for each group, I can use this t-test option. I can ask for just the means and standard deviations from each group. I can, let's ask for the pooled t-test. So this is giving me males minus females. So the difference says that the females was a larger number. Here's a picture of what the p-value is telling us. So here's the, uh, the difference is minus five, so that shows up here. The t-ratio is minus 2.9, so that's telling us that this value of minus five is about almost three standard deviations below what we would expect if there was no difference. We can see the two-sided p-value. We can see the one-sided upper p-value and the one-sided lower p-value. Again, the ANOVA overall p-value. 
and we can ask for additional output like comparing means. If we had more than two groups, we might want to do a multiple comparison procedure, so we might use all pair, pairwise comparisons with the two key on a significant difference pairwise adjustment. We might use Sue's multiple comparison with the best adjustment or Dunnett's comparison with the control adjustment for multiple comparisons. So there's a lot you can get from the fit Y by X bivariate menu, but what you can't get is multiple X's or multiple Y's. So let's open this other data set, Titanic. So this data set would, um, is information about passengers who were on the Titanic. We know whether these passengers survived or did not survive. We know what passenger class they were, first, second, or third. We know if they're male or female. We know their age. We know how many siblings and spouses they were traveling with, how many parents and children they were traveling with. And so we might quickly use fit Y by X to predict survival based on, for example, uh, passenger class or age. So again, I'm doing two different analyses. If I'm using passenger class to predict survival, I'm down here in a chi-squared contingency analysis. If I'm using age to predict survival, I'm down here in a logistic regression. So here's what I'd get for the chi-squared contingency table type of analysis. The height of this bar is the proportion, the chance of survival versus non-survival. The width of the bar is the proportion of the data that are in first class versus second class versus third class. So more of the data are third class. And so I can see a trend that if you're in first class, your probability of survival is pretty big compared to not survival. If you're in third class, it's the opposite. I can see a contingency table on this data. I can see a likelihood ratio and a Pearson chi-squared test and their p-values. And I get some follow-up things that I can do, Cochrane-Armitage trend test, et cetera. And here's the logistic regression output. The, in this case, this line is showing the trend as age increases. So as you get older, the probability, the proportion of this that's a no gets much higher. So as you get older, your chance of surviving gets much more to, that you don't survive. So you decrease your chance of survival as you uh, get older in this data set. Again, we get a p-value, and we can do some follow-up tests. We can look at ROC curves, lift curves, the odds ratio. We can do inverse prediction. We can save this formula back to the data table. Okay, but let's explore this logistic regression a little bit more, but throwing in some additional x variables. So if I go to analyze, and fit model. This is where I can now put in multiple X variables or multiple Y variables or both. So here I want to predict survival. And I think that passenger class and sex and age, maybe how many siblings and spouses and parents and children you're traveling with, all of these might be important. So I can click on each of these and move them into this box by clicking on add or I can drag them into the box. I also want not just the main effects for these, but I also want to put in two-way interactions. So I'm going to have to use this macros button if I want to get all of these things into the model at the same time. So I notice that this says degree two. I'm going to now click on macros and factorial to degree. That degree is the two, and so I'm going to get all the main effects and all the two-way interactions if I do factorial to degree. Full factorial would give me the main effects, the two-way interactions, the three-way interactions, all the way up to the, the fullest factorial. Or I could add all the terms individually by adding them one at a time or adding the main effects in a group and then using clicking on multiple things and clicking cross. You can also put nested effects in here if that's uh, pertinent. So I'll say factorial to degree, and now I have all the main effects and I have all the two-way interactions. This personality switched automatically to nominal logistic when I put survived here because, again, jump is context dependent. So it sees this is a categorical variable I'm predicting. So it says well, you're probably doing nominal logistic regression. But it also shows me I could choose a stepwise uh, model selection method. I could use the generalized regression platform. I could use generalized linear models or partial least squares. So there are other options available to me for this variable type also. I do want nominal logistic right now, so I'll select yes. And I can choose what target level, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to predict. I'd like to predict survival, so I'm going to change that to 1 and then click Run. 
So first I get an effect summary of all the variables ordered by significance. So tiniest p-values first, so passenger class is the most significant variable, sex is very important. The interaction between passenger class and sex is very important. I can look at the false discovery rate to adjust p-values if I want to. I can look at the effect tests here. And some really awesome things, so I can get wall tests, confidence intervals, odds ratios. Um, the indicator parameterization, if I want, jump uses an effect parameterization, so plus one, minus one. If you wanted zero and one parameterization, you can click here. But the profiler is something I really want to draw your attention to. So the profiler in jump visually demonstrates what's ha what the effect is of these variables. So if I look at the profiler, this is telling me the probability of survival so the probability survived is yes, is 96%. If you're passenger class one, you're female, you're 29.881 years old, you have about half of a sibling and spouse traveling with you, and about 4 point, or 0 0.42 parents and children traveling with you. So these values are kind of nonsensical. Maybe I'll change them. Maybe you have one parent or child traveling with you. Maybe you have zero siblings and spouses. So I have adjusted the survival probability slightly. It's 0.962. I can also switch if I, instead of predicting for passenger class one, I can predict for passenger class two. Now instead of 0.962, I'm down to 0.955 probability of survival, which is still pretty similar. However, if I stay female, stay about 30 years old, no siblings and spouses, one parent and child traveling with me, and I switch down to passenger class three, now there's a dramatic change in my chance of survival. Now the probability is just 51.4% chance of survival. And another great thing about the profiler is to see the effect of an interaction. Remember that passenger class and sex, the interaction is significant. So watch the shape of this passenger class curve as I switch from being female to being male. So the effect for female for passenger class is this curve. One and two is similar and then it drops for three. If I move to male, that curve changes. So now one drops dramatically to two and drops again to three. So if you watch again, I'll switch back and forth between female and male, you can see the effect of an interaction. An interaction is saying that the effect of one variable is different depending on the level of the other variable. So that's obvious from this prediction profiler. Okay, I'm going to use this data set to jump us straight into some more complicated models. So we've looked at, in Analyze, we looked at distribution for univariate statistics, testing a mean, testing a proportion, and just exploring data. We used fit y by x to do bivariate relationships, like ANOVA, regression, chi-squared contingency tests, and logistic regression, but only one x and one y. We looked at tabulate before as a way to visually explore data in a table. We'll return to Text Explorer, and we, we spend some time now in fit model doing a more complicated model with multiple x's or multiple y's. But I'm going to quickly jump us into some advanced models. We're going to look in the predictive modeling at a partition model. So this is using CART sort of methods, so classification and regression tree methods. So I'm going to use a partition model to predict survival. So same idea, we're still trying to predict who from the Titanic survived. I have the same idea of the variables that will be interesting. I think passenger class, sex, age, how many siblings and spouses, how many parents and children, these might all be interesting. I'm going to use a decision tree. I have these other options as well. I'm not going to set aside a validation portion right now, although if I were trying to build this decision tree in order to use it on future data, I would want a validation portion. I would want to make sure I'm not overfitting the data I have. I'll click OK. And so first I just get some summary of the data set. There were 1,309 people in this data set. The proportion of survival overall is smaller than the proportion of not survival. And then I can also control click or right click here and set colors to make these maybe more meaningful to me. So not surviving maybe will be in red and maybe I'll change the color for yes surviving to green, for example. So green is good that was, and red is bad. So if I click split, I get the first most predictive split, and that is being female versus being male. So if you're female, you have a much higher chance of survival than if you're male. 
I click split again, I get the next most predictive split. You can't ever go backwards, so it's, it's already assuming we've split out the sex, female and male, but now after accounting for that, the next most predictive split is within the female tree, and that is females who are passenger class one and two have a much higher chance of survival than females that were passenger class three. I can split again, and now I see the next most predictive split is in the male tree, and that's if you were older than 10 or your age isn't in the data set, or if you're younger than 10 is predictive of your survival. If you were a, a child younger than 10, a male child, you had a higher chance of survival than if you were older than 10 or if the data is missing. And I can keep splitting and seeing more information. So now if you were older than 10, so if you're an adult male, being passenger class one has a higher chance of survival than passenger class two or three. So I can explore on this regression or, or classification tree, in this case, uh, what's most predictive. And if I keep going, I'll end up at some point. So age was a continuous variable, remember. So age and then siblings and spouse is also continuous. So what's happening here is that JUMP is finding a split that makes sense within that range of data. So this was not categorized as age greater than or equal to 10 or missing and age not or less than 10. JUMP is finding the most predictive spot in that continuous variable to split at. So the same thing happens here at this split. Siblings and spouses less than three or greater than or equal to three becomes predictive. Let's look at one more example of our partition. And that's here on this mushroom data set. This data set is edibility of mushrooms, so whether they're poisonous or edible, and then a bunch of features about these mushrooms. So if we wanted to create sort of a decision tree to say, is this mushroom safe to eat? I could go to analyze, I could go to predictive modeling and to partition, just like we did a moment ago. I'm trying to predict edibility and I want to use all my data. So I say, okay. I see that it's almost a 50-50 split of edible versus poisonous mushrooms, a little bit more edible. Again, I think I want to change the colors here. I want the edible mushrooms to be a happy green, the poisonous mushrooms to be a scary red, and I split. So I see the first most predictive split is on the odor of the mushrooms. If the uh, mushrooms have no odor or smell like almond or anise, they are probably safe to eat. On the other hand, if they smell foul, musty, pungent, fishy, they are certainly not safe to eat. I can split again and see, okay, in the case that they don't have a scent or they're almond or anise, now I know for sure, still don't eat them if their spore print color is green. These, these are all gonna kill you. But if their spore print color is not green, then they might still be safe. And I can split again. I can see here, if their ring stalk color is yellow or brown, they might be dangerous. I can split again and see that, oh, actually, as long as the stalk root is bulbous, they're going to be safe. It's only if it's missing or club and yellow or brown ring that it's dangerous. So I can use this as a decision tree to help me choose which mu mushrooms are safe to eat and which are not. So I think that's a kind of fun example. All right, let's look at Titanic passengers again and look at another uh, model option. So let's go back to fit model. We're still predicting survival. We're still interested in passenger class, sex, age, these variables, and maybe I still want factorial to degree two. But instead of using nominal logistic, let's use generalized regression to explore some variable selection options. So I, the distribution here is binomial. That's the only option I get. But generalized regression would let me use any of these other distributions for the response. The target level I'd like to predict is one, that you do survive. And so here's some estimation methods that I get to use for mo model selection, for variable selection. So the lasso is here, the double lasso, just ordinary logistic regression as we did before. Forward selection, two-stage forward selection. I would recommend forward selection and two-stage forward selection when you have a designed experiment. And I'd recommend lasso, double lasso, when you have observational data, and maybe compare that to elastic net and to ridge. I can choose a validation method like k-fold cross-validation holdback. I can use the BIC, the corrected AIC, or this ERIC method as a way to, to decide what's the best fitting model. The ERIC method was developed for the lasso, so that would be a good choice in this case. I can say go, and I get this solution path. It's showing me from the least complicated model to the most complicated model 
and choosing what it thinks is the best fitting model based on that error criterion. So smaller is better, just like with corrected AIC and BIC. So the best fitting model is this one, which corresponds to the model that's shown below with these terms, the sex term, some passenger class by sex, some passenger class by age interaction pieces. And I can wiggle this around if I want to choose a different model. So fewer, fewer terms in the model, a less complicated model, or a more complicated model. And I can again ask for the profiler to explore what this means in prediction. And so here I have even confidence intervals for that probability of survival. So here, if you're passenger class one, you're female, you're about 30 years old, uh, half of a sibling and spouse, 0.42 parents and children. And the reason these numbers keep popping up is these are the averages in the data set or the most commonly occurring. Uh, and so here we have 95% chance of survival under these conditions with a confidence interval for the mean of 0.92 to 0.97. And again, I can switch between, I can watch the interaction effect if I watch passenger class as I switch from female to male. And I can see that I have much less confidence in predicting the older ages because I have less data out there and that induces less confidence in other areas as well. And so the confidence intervals help me understand which part of this distribution I really know very much about where I had much data. Okay, so we've now looked at distribution for univariate statistics, fit Y by X for bivariate, tabulate and graph and graph builder for exploring data visually uh, and in tables, fit model for a lot of options. Let's now use fit model for mixed models. So if you had random effects or repeated measures, so let me open this example. This is a split plot example. And what, what we have is six carcasses. So the blue oval is sort of like a meat carcass. And then we're taking out three pieces from, that, from each car carcass. We're applying the top level factor to that, which is tenderizer in this case. Or we're applying one tenderizer level here, a different tenderizer level here, a different tenderizer level here. So that's our factor A, our top whole plot level factor. And then within the whole plots, we're taking four subsamples. These are our subplots. And we're assigning randomly the, the subplot factor to that factor B, which in this case is the roasting time. So we're giving them different times to be in the oven. And so typically, for this type of design, we'd have something that would look like this. So the top blocks, the carcasses, would be a, a factor we'll put into the model. The top factor, tenderizer, we'll put into the model. That will be a fixed effect, whereas the block would be a random effect because we're just randomly choosing six carcasses. And then the block by A effect is going to be the error term for that top level part of our experiment. That's defining the experimental unit for the A factor. So blocks and A will be tested against this blocks by A experimental error. And then the B factor, the, the roasting time, and the A by B interaction will be tested against the overall error from the bottom level, the subplot error. So if I go to Analyze and Fit Model, here's the, the mixed model option is one of the personalities. So we've looked at generalized regression. We've looked at nominal logistic. Uh, let's use mixed model now. I can put Y in as the Y variable. I can put uh, carcass, remember, is going to be, let me move this to the side. So we want carcass to be random. So I'll go into the random effects and put carcass as random. Now, carcass by A is also going to be random because uh, a random effect is sort of like a disease. So anybody who touches that disease gets the disease. So when you cross a random effect with a fixed effect, the baby is a random effect. So I'm going to put carcass by, uh, let's see, the A factor is the tenderizer. I'm going to cross these. And this is also a random effect because carcass was random. I'll go back and put in the fixed effects, which are the tenderizer, the roasting time, and their interaction. So here I'll use the full factorial. Tenderizer, roasting time, and tenderizer by roasting time. So this is A, this is B, and this is A by B. There's no repeated measures, but if we had a repeated measures uh, sort of situation, we can put in all these different covariance structures for the repeated measures. And then I can click Run. And we can confirm here with the de degrees of freedom for the denominator, both in this fixed effect parameter estimates and down here in the fixed effects tests. We can see that the tenderizer the denominator degrees of freedom is 10, and that indicates to us that this 
test was done correctly. So the tenderizer, which is the A factor, should have been tested against that blocks by A interaction, which would have had degrees of freedom, the number of blocks minus one, just six minus one is five, times number of treatment A minus one, so that's three minus one is two, so five times two is 10. So there should be 10 degrees of freedom for the error term for that high level whole plots part of the experiment. And then for the other effects, for the B effect and for the A by B effect, then we get the subplot error term, which is much larger. So we can confirm here that we're getting the correct tests. And so here we see the p-values, everything is significant in this experiment. And we can do follow-up things by clicking on the red triangle and looking at multiple comparisons, for example. We can save information like the prediction formula, residuals, etc. Okay, so I showed you some sort of basic exploration things, and then I showed you a sampling of some of the much more complicated and advanced models that you can do in JUMP. I hope that's helpful to you to realize there's there's a lot that's really accessible right away as you're a new JUMP user. Uh, using the analyzed distribution to explore the data, especially with that dynamic linkage, using graph and graph builder, using tabulate. These are places to go right away and, it, and you can very quickly get very functional using these. And then as you're doing uh, more complicated models, as you're realizing you have a split plot design and need to use random effects, um, but if you're doing variable selection and you want to use some of these techniques in the GenReg platform, if you want to use some of these predictive modeling options, there's a lot of functionality that's far beyond just the basic as well in JUMP. And so hopefully this is giving you sort of an idea of some of the things you'll do every time with data and some of the specialized things you might do for certain modeling types. Okay, and then let's also look really quickly at how to get correlations and principal components, factor analysis, discriminant analysis, those sort of things. This body measurements data set um, is just a bunch of continuous measurements. And so if I go to analyze and to multivariate methods and multivariate, this is where you can find correlations. So if I just get correlations for everybody, I can get this, the scatter plot matrix of the correlations and I can also get uh, matrix of the correlations. And from here I can do further things like ask for non-parametric correlations, I can do an item reliability, principal components on the correlations from here, an outlier analysis that gives me the Mahalanobis distance. So there's a lot of multivariate things I can get from here. And there were also a lot of multivariate things I can get from that same multivariate methods platform. So multivariate here gets me the correlations and then more options, but I can also go directly to principal components or partially squares, et cetera. All right, one very last thing, just because it's awesome and you should know it exists, is the text analysis. So I'm gonna open this pet survey and just show you, this is a, a fictional data set that's just survey responses to think about your pet, tell me something about your pet. And so if we go to analyze and to text explorer, I can put survey response into the text column. I can change the number of words per phrase, the number of phrases that I'm looking at, number of characters. I can stem or not stem, which is just the word go and going would be the same word if I'm stemming, because the stem is the same. If I don't stem, then go is a different word than going. I can say okay, I get a count of these terms, how frequently they're used. There are 372 distinct terms in the data set. I can see phrases. So some things you wanna do are right clicking, right clicking all the time. You can show the text for different phrases. You can add phrases to the analysis. You can add stop words if there are words that you aren't interested in. I can click add stop word and take it out of the analysis. And then I can go very quickly to display options, show word cloud to see a nice visual of this. And I might change the layout to centered, and I might change the color Oops. by right-clicking and changing the color. And then I can get a lot more analyses type things like the document term matrix, a topic analysis, I can cluster the terms or documents, et cetera, and then use those things back in a, another more traditional analysis. Okay, so thanks for sticking with me. I think it's just after one now, so I'll see if Mia has any questions collected from you guys, and I'll, I'll take a que questions for a couple minutes.